So good morning, everyone. Thank you for um, the invitation to talk about this very timely, I would say, subject. Uh, and uh, I hope I'll convince you that small telescopes will play a very important role in, in the coming uh, years, not only because of, of the CTA, but generally speaking, in this new era of, of large-scale surveys, um, like you see in the S4, in the radio, and very soon, LSST in the optical and of course size does matter uh, so there is science cases that you can only do with big telescopes but i will argue that there is a lot of very interesting science that you can only do with with small telescopes and uh, there is uh, also a lot of science that you can doesn't really make sense to do with with the big big telescopes so uh, especially, you know, in connection with, with CTA, I think it's uh, never too early to start thinking about the, the interesting synergies and ways that, you know, we can build up the community and our instruments and capabilities in support of, of the large scale surveys. And this is particularly important for polarimetry because um, there are not a lot of telescopes in the world with polarimetric capabilities. And the reason for that is that polarimetry is hard and people try to to avoid it as as much as they can but also the universe is not very polarized and this is because it's dominated mostly by thermal processes and thermal processes don't really have a reason to make polarized light the but there is also a lot of symmetry in in the universe so for example if you take a look at the sun and you look at different regions on the sun, then you will find that this is a very polarized uh, source. But if you look at any other star in the sky, uh, which is far away, and you get emission from, from the entire sphere, basically cancel out all the polarization, and um, you see some unpolarized uh, source. So we need sort of ways to break that symmetry, and the best is using magnetic fields, and um, magnetic fields are responsible for what we call non-thermal processes. The most famous of one is obviously synchrotron radiation, which is very, very polarized. But magnetic fields are also very important for many physical uh, processes that are happening in a lot of different sources that are, uh, I think, very relevant to, to CTA as well. And I will I'll tell you a little bit about those sources, starting from you know, the small black holes, and I'll make my way up to the bigger um, uh, black holes. But before I do that, let me tell you a little bit about how we measure polarization in, in the optical. And there are, of course, different ways you can do it, but the basic principle is the same. You have light coming in uh, from your telescope on the left here, and then you have some halfway plate, uh, some birefringent crystal. Uh, nowadays, the most common one is what we call the Wollaston prism. And then you have your detector, which for optical telescopes, that's just a CCD uh, camera. So the main idea is that you will rotate the plane of polarization using the halfway plate, and you will measure the intensity of the light coming from your source in different angles. And you need at least four, which you can see up there, at least for, for, for linear polarization. And uh, you know, if you measure the intensity of those four different angles, you can combine the measurements uh, estimate what we call the Stokes parameters, and then from that calculate the polarization degree and angle of, of your source. Uh, as you can imagine, this is a very inefficient process, and it takes much longer to do you know, a single measurement that you would normally do with just doing photometry. Uh, and of course, while you do your measurements, you assume that the sky and your source have not changed. And in many cases, this is not, not really um, uh, true. Then that introduces systematics that then you know cause you problems and really limit how faint or how low polarization you can measure. So people have been trying to be um, sort of creative with their their designs and try to overcome some of these difficulties. And one that's been been developed at the um, University of Turku and one version of that is at the Nordic Optical Telescope is the Dipole Two uh, polarimeter. Uh, which is basically has the same design. You have a halfway plate, a birefringent crystal. In this case is a calcite uh, block. And then you have your detectors, but instead of having one CCD camera, you have three, and you send light uh, 
in all three. So basically, you send a different optical band in each CCD. So it still takes you about the same amount of time to do the measurement, but you get a lot more color information out of that. The state of the art at the moment is what we call one shot polarimeters. And one of the earliest design are um, the one you see here, which is Robopole, which I'll tell you a lot more, more about, where you have two halfway plates and two Wallerstone prisms side by side. Uh, there are no moving parts. And as light comes in from your telescope, gets split uh, simultaneously into four different polarization orientations. Uh, but then you could just do photometry on, on that and measure the Stokes parameters and all the polarization information we need in just a single uh, exposure, which makes a very uh, makes a very efficient instrument for, for monitoring. If you're wondering what that looks like, this is an actual image from, from Robopole where every cluster of four spots that you see, like uh, this one here, it corresponds to one source on the plane of the sky, which is projected in four different polarization um, orientations on your, your CCD. And of course, we the source that is of interest to us, we put it in the center where we have this mask, and that allows us to uh, block any unwanted light and reduce the background, which allows for much more precise measurements of, of the polarization. I will be, of course, uh, you know, talking a lot about Robopole, but I cannot not acknowledge all the uh, many different uh, small telescopes around the world from Japan to Hawaii and everything in between that over the years have really produced a lot of very interesting um, science. And I'll mention some of those, those results. Uh, of course, I cannot mention everything. So uh, I apologize in advance if I don't do your telescope or your, your results um, justice. Uh, and towards the end, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about our current efforts to coordinate many of these small telescopes for, for very exciting uh, science projects. So for Robopole, we are a small collaboration of about six institutes in, in three different continents, uh, but our base is the University uh, of Crete and the Skinnikus Observatory uh, that you see here. And we're using for all our observations the 1.3 meter telescope uh, and that, that's here and that tiny instrument you see down there that is a uh, robopole is actually very compact and easy to move around um, our primary objective was to study blazars and uh, in particular we wanted to study a unique phenomenon that happens in blazars which is called the rotation of the polarization angle and i'll tell you more about that but of course if you have a a good polarimeter in your hands, you want to do other uh, other science as well. And we try to do as, as much as you know we could. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, about that as well. But if you see something that's of interest to you and I have not mentioned it, please feel free to to ask me about it. So starting off with the um, small black holes and the ones that make very, very energetic events that um, I'm sure are very, uh, very much of interest of CTA are GRBs and GRBs can be highly polarized. And you can see here the uh, really beautiful results from the Liverpool telescope where they found at very early times, a high degree of, of polarization up to 30 30%, which seems to go down a little bit, but it sort of, sorry, stabilizes around, around 20%. And at the same time, the polarization angle was roughly um, constant. Uh, of course, uh, this is not all GRBs are, are polarized. And uh, of course, they, they show very different, different behavior. Um, so just a year later, uh, we observed our very first um, GRB with, with Robopole at similar time scales was very fairly close to to the burst and we saw very different behavior. So we now see very low degree of polarization, uh, about two percent, which is constant. And uh, as it turns out, this is most likely coming from the dust in our galaxy. This is what we call interstellar polarization. So basically, the GRB was less than than two percent. Uh, polarized uh, in this case. We had uh, another GRB observed very recently, and we're now looking at uh, timescales, which are much larger. So uh, 
and we see do see very different behavior as well. So in the beginning, there was you know very low degree of polarization, although in this case we think it's intrinsic. Uh, and then suddenly towards the end of observations, we see sort of a jump in in the polarization degree and a change in the polarization angle. So this is the very um, first time that the polarization evolution of a GRB was was actually followed that uh, that late. Uh, and um, this is the first time we've, we've seen that sort of jump, and it's not exactly clear why that would happen, although there are just a couple of models that, that could, could explain that, but that just tells you, uh, you know, how, how important it is to do polarization observations of the GRB, and there's still a lot, uh, a lot to learn from that. What probably would be much more of interest for, for CTA folks is the very recent, uh, very bright GRB, which I'm, I'm sure you've um, you've heard about. That happened just you know, two months ago. And that would really have been a very prime target uh, for CTA because it was very bright in gamma rays and, and stayed bright for a very, very long time. Uh, unfortunately, there was bad weather at the Skinnikus Observatory at the time. But we did manage to get observations with the Nordic Optical Telescope, which is in La Palma, so just next door from when where CTA would be. And uh, we got some measurements with that. And, and what's very interesting is that in this case, we also managed to get measurements using the Imaging X-ray Polarimeter Explorer. Uh, so this is the first and maybe the only uh, GRB that we were able to get both X-ray and optical polarization measurements. At the same time, there were um, two GCNs associated with those measurements. I can tell you that the polarization in, in both X-rays and optical is, is low, uh, but that's all I'm allowed to say at this at this point. Uh, but you know, if you're really interested in that, don't don't despair just yet. There is a paper coming out very soon that that has all the all the information. Um, so moving on to another class of objects that I think are very interesting to, to CTA, and that is binaries, and especially the class of they call gamma ray binaries. And now there are a few that have been uh, detected by Fermi, and there is a couple that have uh, been detected also in, in very high energy gamma rays. But of course, CTA will, will detect a lot more of the sources. And what I'm showing you here is the results from the Kanata telescope at the University of Hiroshima, uh, looking at the bright outburst that happened in B404 Cygni in 2015, where there was um, quite a bit of polarization. They found about 8% um, polarization, but that turned out to be um, interstellar. And you can see that here, where basically the, the line show you the orientation of the polarization. Uh, blue is for the source, the red is for the nearby stars, and as you can see that there's sort of a line, and this is kind of a smoking gun for the interstellar uh, polarization. You can really see that when you do the, uh, in this plot, where you do the polarization angle versus polarization degree, you can see all the stars are in that uh, that direction. And of course, at the bottom here, you see some messy demodeling uh, of the source, and it is obvious that all of the gamma ray information is missing. So that would be uh, really, really great to have you know, CTA cover all that range and then with the constraints also from, from the low energies, uh, I think would be very important in understanding the underlying emission processes and, and the sources. Moving on to the sort of bigger black holes, and there is a type of, uh, of sources that I think are not being um, you know, gamma ray community has not paid too much attention to them, and I think they really should, and uh, especially I think CTA should start um, putting them in, in your, your radar, and those are tidal disruption events. Uh, this is basically when a star comes very close to a black hole, uh, close enough for the, the gravity of the black hole to overpower the self-gravity of the star, and at which point it will sort of rip it apart and consume its gas by forming an accretion disk. Now we had sort of models of how that star capture would happen since you know back in the 70s, but basically the way we observed the sources um, today matches closer to what Rich predicted in 1988. And very soon after, uh, the uh, ROSAT, which was an X-ray satellite, detected the first events. 
at uh, um, now we think that those happen at the rate of 10 to the minus 5 per year per galaxy. Our actual classification rate at the moment is 10 to 15 events per year. So basically talking about spectroscopic classification. And in just a couple of years from now, the expected rate uh, of discovery from LSST would be 10 to 20 events per night. Of course, this is the discovery rate, so a lot of the events will be too faint to do anything about. Um, at least in the beginning, a lot of them will go unclassified because there's simply a limited amount of time for, for spectroscopy and follow-up observations. But you can imagine that slowly we'll build a big enough sample of spectroscopically confirmed uh, TDEs that you can feed your, to your machine learning network and um, you know, train it so that it will be able to identify the TDEs from the raw data stream of LSST. So at that point, you will have a much, um, a very big population of transients that you, you could be looking at. And I think those should be of, of high interest for CTA because um, there is a lot of discussion that this might be multi-messenger uh, events. And there is some some of the papers discussing that they could be accelerating ultra high energy cosmic rays. Uh, there are a couple of papers now suggesting that this could be neutrino emitters, and this is from one of such paper from from Velsen et al. Where you see the uh, outburst in optical is this red and green uh, points, and then the blue and purple ones are the dusty echo that comes um, later. And as you can see, there is sort of a neutrino that's coming at the peak of the infrared flare. There is, of course, already some theoretical motivation and, and work where kind of the neutrinos and the gamma rays will be made in these sources. The expectations now are not um, very optimistic, but there's a lot of uncertainty in, in these models. And the reason for that is that we don't fully understand um, you know, how exactly does this disruption happens, how the accretion disk is formed, and why do we, you know, some TDEs seem to be very bright in X-rays, which is, you know, what you would expect from a super Eddington event, uh, while the majority that we see and the majority that LSST will be, will be finding very soon um, we are faint in X-rays and often go undetected. And there are two scenarios for that. One is that the accretion disk forms uh, very rapidly. So as soon as you disrupt the star, the gas quickly forms the accretion disk, starts radiating, um, radiating X-rays. But there is a lot of gas from the star that hasn't made it to the accretion disk. And that gas will form sort of a screen, and it will absorb the X-rays and then re-emit them to optical and UV. And in that case, we expect to have a sort of a low degree of, of polarization. Uh, the alternative is that you have a slow formation scenario where the uh, gas doesn't uh, circularize quickly enough. And instead, as it goes around the black hole, forms shocks at the pericenter and the apocenter of, the, um, of its orbit. And then the shocks make optical and UV and the process circularize the uh, flow into an accretion disk. And in this case, we expect to see high and variable uh, degree of polarization. So we did a, our a first attempt into understanding the polarization properties of, um, of TDEs using Robol and the Nordic Optical Telescope. And you see here sort of the results. This is one event called AT2020 MOT. And you can see the ZTF light curve, uh, which shows a very standard uh, evolution. And at the bottom here, this is the very first polarized light curve of, um, of a tidal disruption event, which only consists of four points, but there's a lot of, of information in this uh, for observations. And uh, first of all, we, we found that TDs can be highly polarized up to 25%. And this is without a jet. There is no, no, no jet in this, this particular uh, TDE. What is really important was we're actually able to map the kind of evolution of the polarization to the evolution of, of the tidal shocks that we know from the slow formation simulations. So we were fairly confident, that at least in this case, this early accretion disk formation happens through, through tidal shocks. Of course, this is, um, you know, just one statistics of one. Uh, 
We don't really know whether this is the standard picture for all TDs or this is some, some exceptional event, but uh, we're doing the best we can to observe more of this TDs in polarization. And uh, very soon uh, we're going to know if, if this happens all the time or in very exceptional cases. But you can imagine if we sort of succeed in understanding what's going on, we'll set a framework where we can build all our models uh, and then with the constraints that, that come from, from CTA, we can understand the, the whether the sources are indeed neutrino emitters uh, or not. Now, moving on to uh, blazars. Have a single star, but you have a continuous stream of gas flowing to the black hole, and it powers a very highly relativistic jet that's pointed towards your line of sight. And I think uh, blazars will turn out to be really the bread and butter science for CTA. And there are a lot of different questions that we want to um, address and want to answer. Some of them are very basic ones. Like, for example, you know, what is the jet made up of and what is the, um, the origin of the gamma rays that we see in blazars? But we also want to understand a little bit more about how particle acceleration happens uh, in the jets and maybe finally differentiate between shocks and, and magnetic reconnection as, as the dominant mechanism. So for the um, origin of the gamma rays, there are basically two scenarios with either looking at electrons in the jet and electrons make uh, high energies, high energy radiation through inverse Compton scattering. So basically, they propagate in the jet, they see some target photon field, and they upscatter it to higher energies. If this is an external photon field of the jet, we call it external Compton. If it's from the jet itself, uh, so the electrons make the photons and upscatter them, we call that synchrotrons of Compton. Um, the alternative is that you have protons in your jet, and the protons make synchrotron, or they will interact with other protons. Other photons make pions, and then pions decay to... Um, secondary particles and, and gamma rays. So this, uh, you know, the distinction between the processes and the question of, of the jet composition is, is also very timely because of the, again, possible neutrino association with, with blazar. And at least in the initial results from that showed that neither a purely leptonic uh, nor a purely hadronic model can explain both the multi-wavelength and the neutrino emission we saw from uh, from that source. So we thought we'll take a sort of a different look on, on that problem in the jet composition through circular polarization. And basically, if you have an electron-positron uh, jet, then uh, you will cancel out the circular polarization signal. If instead you add protons in your mix, then um, you break the symmetry and you get a small amount of circular polarization, which depends on, on a couple of things, but also depends on the level of the linear polarization. So we were able uh, very recently to observe two sources. Uh, there are these are very famous blazars with the 1.9 meter telescope at the South African Astronomical Observatory. And uh, we didn't get a detection, but we were able to place a, a pretty good upper limit of about 1%. Uh, which really allows us to constrain the parameter space, both in terms of, of the magnetic field that you have in your emission region, but also the uh, positron fraction. So this is basically the fraction of, of positrons to electrons, and uh, everything else is protons to preserve your charge neutrality. So for, and this is basically the results you see here. And for proton models to be to be efficient, you need high levels, of high, high values of the magnetic field, and you need to low levels of the positron fraction. So you have a lot of protons, high magnetic field, and all that region, as you can see, is excluded by the observations. Um, you can have any uh, jet composition, but then you need to be at very low magnetic field value, uh, which then proton models are not very efficient. Or you can have any magnetic field value, but then you're in a regime where uh, most of your jet is made out of electron-positron pairs and you have only a few protons. And that also is not very helpful. So at least for the, you know, from the point of view of the circular polarization in the optical, if, if neutrinos are indeed associated with blazars, 
then that needs to come from either some extrinsic event or this you know, hybrid or what they call the hadronic models or uh, subdominant hadronic um, populations. And this is where really CTA comes comes in handy, and uh, because if you have all these leptohadronic models and the, the subdominant proton populations, then you should see something stick out in your um, gamma ray spectrum. And this is basically what you see here. If you're only looking at electrons, there's no reason for um, inverse complex scattering to do anything else but a smooth uh, curve, as as you see here. So you can imagine kind of the uh, constraints from both the circular polarization and the composition of the jets and also the spectrum from, from CDA will be very, very important in our understanding the underlying high energy emission processes and, and the sources. So thinking about particle acceleration, you heard from uh, Giorgio Matt in the previous seminar about our very exciting results on, on Macarin uh, 501 and the very first detection of X-ray polarization. From, from a blazer, and that really points us to shocks being the, the main particle acceleration mechanism in, in the jet. Since then, we've actually measured a couple of other uh, sources, and we're basically getting the same, the same behavior. But all our observations so far happened on when the sources were in an average state. They were not, not really in quiescent, but they were not really flaring uh, either. So at least for the sort of steady state emission, uh, we are fairly confident that shocks are, are the main particle um, accelerators here. But we don't really know what happens during outburst. And we, we've seen some very um, extreme behavior when, when blazers are, are flaring. Although we are trying with, um, with high speed to get sources in flaring states uh, at the moment, but still we don't have any uh, we're not very lucky with that. So in Neurobopo, we try to understand uh, a little bit more the role of magnetic fields uh, and in that particle acceleration process. And as I've said, we wanted to understand uh, more of this unique phenomenon of the rotation of the polarization angle. So basically, the polarization angle in blazers varies stochastically until it suddenly doesn't. And uh, suddenly we'll start going through this monotonic rotation uh, towards one direction that you see in red here. And then once it stops doing what it's doing, it's just gonna continue on um, randomly fluctuating. So we managed to detect a large number of, of these rotations. Uh, we basically tripled the number of known rotations in just a couple of years. And then we started um, exploring their properties and one very interesting connection we wanted to explore is, is the connection with the gamma ray activity. And this is what you see here. So basically what I'm showing you is the time difference between the middle point of a rotation and the peak of the nearest gamma ray flare as seen by Fermi. And as you can see, this time difference is certain very much about zero. So every time we would detect the rotation, there was always a gamma ray flare coming with it. And at least statistically speaking, this is very, very unlikely to happen just, just by chance. So we know that the rotations are very much connected to, to gamma ray um, uh, activity, but it turns out they're also connected to uh, very high energy uh, gamma ray activity. And you see here some really beautiful results from the MAGIC collaboration on 0716 where there is you know, flaring at, at very high energy gamma rays. There is then flaring X-rays, optical, all the way down to, to uh, 15 gigahertz radio. And you see also this very fast rotation of, of the polarization angle, which I may have the blow up here, where it was captured by a few different, um, a few meter class telescopes. So this, this event was interpreted as shock-shock interaction. And that is because when looking at the VBI maps, they saw that there was a, a moving feature that crossed a standing uh, component in the jet of 0716. So basically you have a shock that's moving in the jet and it hits the stationary shock and you have all the flaring up to you know high energy gamma rays and you see the rotation of the polarization angle. 
Uh, we saw a very similar behavior uh, in uh, different sources a couple of years later. That's from uh, what you see here from 3C454.3, where again, we see a lot of flaring across the different bands from radio, from, sorry, gamma rays all the way to infrared. And we see this drop in the polarization uh, degree, which is very sharp. And at the same time, we see this rotation of the polarization angle. Uh, again, if you look at the VLBI uh, observations, we do see something moving in the jet. And as soon as it breaks out from, from the core of, of the blazar, then we get all the flaring and the rotation of the polarization angle. So we're very confident that we're again looking at um, shock shock um, interactions. Uh, but then just last week when I was showing uh, part of, of those results to the IAU symposium that happened in, in Kathmandu, um, after my talk, Hao Ching Zhang came to me and showed me this figure and told me I have a, uh, simulations from magnetic reconnection that do exactly the same thing. And this is basically what he was talking about where you can see there is flaring in, in optical and gamma rays here. There is a drop, the polarization, and there is also the rotation of the polarization angle. So we're really back to, to scratch. Uh, we have two models and both can give you exactly uh, the same results. So uh, the way out of this is to, you know, push push our, our limits basically and you know, get more of this uh, events uh go to to higher energies and you know CTA will be very helpful um uh, with that and of course go also to short time scale a shortest time scale variability which starts to become important to differentiate between shocks and magnetic connection and you see here some very uh, nice slide curves, again, from magic and different energy ranges from Macarin uh, 4 to 1, which had a, an outburst very recently. And on the left side, I'm showing you the, the work from uh, from Yeni Yermanainen, which will be uh, available soon, where Yeni made uh, um, a heroic effort to do a framework for the proper comparison between simulations and um, and light curves. And I think that will be very, very important in uh, for CTA because now we can only do the, the very short time scale variability uh, like curves for just a couple of sources in, in very bright states. CTA, of course, will be able to do it for much more sources. Um, and I think it will be very, very important. So at the same time, we have to also build our you know polarization capabilities and to be able to follow this, this short time scale and support also the CTA observations. And we've, uh, since um, a year ago, we've been trying to coordinate different telescopes across the world uh, to uh, manage to do continuous more than 24 hour observations in the same way that like, Fermi uh, does, right? So we can have a, you know, an apples, apples comparison between the different light curves. And of course, the problem we're facing is the sun. Uh, you know, at, unless you're at the polar cycle, uh, at some point the sun will come up and uh, you will you know, have to stop observing. But you can use the uh, Earth's rotation to your advantage. And you can imagine a scenario where you start observing uh, in, in Japan. And by the time the sun comes up, it's night in, in Europe. By the sun, time is... Um, Morning in Europe, it's night in the United States. So if you place your telescope in, in strategic locations, you will be able to do an uninterrupted, you know, continuous monitoring of your source. And that, that came, we came to call that the non-stop polarization experiment, which consists from a lot of adventurous people and uh, 15 telescopes across the world. And you can see here the both the list of the adventurous people and the different telescopes. The bigger telescope we have is 2.4 meters. Uh, everything is, is much below that. So we had our first one in, in November uh, with a combine of 685 telescope hours. Of course, we lost a lot of that due to, due to weather, but we were able to get pretty good, good coverage for the two targets that we had. At the time, one was BLAC, which was going in, uh, was at a prolonged outburst, and also O211, which um, is a historically highly polarized source, but 
at the time was in a very low uh, state. It was in a the historical quiescent um, state. So just to uh, give you an example of how you can sort of fill up uh, the time, this is the results we have from, from BLAC, and the top is the polarization degree and the bottom the polarization angle. And of course, you know, we start with Japan and, and the Kanata telescope, and then soon after, um, Aries in India starts observing, and then we had a bunch of different telescopes in, in Europe, and finally, you have the U.S. and, and Mexico. And just to give you a sort of how, how the full uh, data set looks like now the top panel just shows you the brightness uh, of the source in magnitude and as you can see there is a lot of micro variability there there's a lot of clear you know flares that we could only properly capture uh, because we had this this continuous more than 24 hour uh, monitoring this is still a work in progress so we're still working on on the data and the interpretation but you can think of it at this point as just as a proof of concept that you know, we, we are able to do this more than uh, 24 hour observations. And I think when CTA come, comes online, there's be very interesting for us to have join, join run together. And I think there's be uh, plenty of very exciting science there. So uh, let me just finish by telling you another, I think very um, interesting synergy between polarization and CTA, which has to do with unidentified uh, CTA objects. And of course, there's going to be an extra galactic survey from CTA, and I, I can bet uh, that you will find gamma ray sources that um, you were not expecting. And uh, maybe polarization can, can help us figure out what, what those sources are. And this is a work we basically started doing because of the Fermi unidentified sources. And you see here one example where Fermi tells us that somewhere in this red circle, this is a 95% um, error of Fermi, there is a gamma ray source. And you can see, you know, there's plenty of optical sources um, in that. But the main idea is that, you know, if you look at the statistics of the gamma ray population, uh, if you're making gamma rays, chances are that you have some sort of a jet and jets make synchrotron, synchrotron is polarized. So then, could be that if you look at for polarized sources and, and that maybe that is also the gamma ray emitter. So we did uh, some simulations where we placed basically blazars in different locations in the sky and we tried to estimate um, the fraction of time that the blazer would be much more polarized than the stars around it. And if you're looking at you know above the galactic plane, where the interstellar polarization is, you know, about 1% or below, then, you know, it's more than 70% of the time, uh, blazer is, is far more polarized than, than the stars. And then, of course, we try to demonstrate uh, this idea by observing all the sources you see here with the, the cyan uh, circles. And this is what the distribution of that uh, field looks like in, in polarization degree. So you see sort of all the stars are sort of in the low uh, polarization degree. And then there is one source that is sort of far from that distribution, which we call the unidentified gamma ray uh, source candidate. Now, what is very interesting is the fact that um, we were looking, when we started this work, we're uh, basically working with a 3FGL. And our candidate source was just outside the 95% um, confident region, uh, just inside there was a radio galaxy. And um, at the, you know, within one sigma, there was a radio source, which we don't really know that much about. Now, when the fourth Fermi catalog was released and they had, you know, twice as much data, much better localization, okay, both in terms of the uncertainty, but also, the, you know, the exact location of the source, the position of that that identified source shifted, and now our candidate uh, is within one sigma. So polarization knew which one was the source making gamma rays uh, even before Fermi could get could get a, a good position of it. So I think there's there's a lot of uh, sort of interesting synergies with with CTA as well on on that front. So I will uh, stop here. And uh, I hope I convinced you how you know small telescopes can be can be very important for for CTA and uh, how polarization.
can be uh, can provide exciting synergies. And uh, um, you know, of course, as I've said, it's not really not too early to start thinking about uh, what we can you know do together and how we can build that community. And I think it's in CTA's best interest to also get its own dedicated uh, polymer. But um, I'm happy to hear your thoughts uh, on that. Uh, thank you very much.